they must be people going and uh, take the toil and I know you're welcome to welcome and thank them. Uh, but I am very, very uh, happy to welcome you all here this morning. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm really thrilled to have so many of you here with us uh, to learn more about how together we can better support the mental health of LGBTQ plus young people. My name is Melinda Griffin and my pronouns that I use are she and her. I'm the CEO of We Belong To LGBTQ Plus Youth Ireland for the past eight years. For two decades now, We Belong To has worked to create an Ireland where LGBTQ plus young people are equal, safe and thriving. Through our youth work, education and training, research and campaigns, we work to create safe spaces for LGBTQ youth. Safer spaces in their homes, their schools, their youth services, and the wider communities. The voices of LGBTQ plus young people inform all our work in Belong To, from our campaigns and communications, to our policy submissions, and the content in our youth groups. So I thought it would be fitting for me to share a video from one of our youth group participants with you this morning to start the event, so you could hear directly uh, from a young person why events like today continue to be so important despite the huge progress in Ireland in recent years in terms of LGBTQ plus equality. So Lord Lauren Simons, who you'll hear from now, composed this piece as part of a project with the Abbey Theatre. The project called Dear, Dear Ireland invited participants to share the message to the nation. And here is what Laura had to say. Ireland, you're so brave. Five years ago, our country was the first in the world to vote by referendum in favour of same-sex marriage. It was 62%, that's great. I'm proud I am. Hello world, I'm here, I'm queer, and nothing can stop me except you. See, I was never warned about you, sure. What would I have to fear? You're my best friend. You wanted to know the truth, but you asked me to lie. I've got nothing against gay people. They're so fun and so sassy. Those dark things are gas. I wish I could do my makeup that well. Because this girl in my class, definitely a lesbian. <laughs> I hope she doesn't fancy me. That's what I heard, and I thought nothing of it because, well, I'm different. I never look at them like that, and they know that. There's no way they're homophobic, sure, their mom's best friend is gay. It's not that they have anything against, it's just I'm too, well, gay. I'll play you down. You know, I hear all of these complaints about wearing a mask in public spaces. It's restrictive, it's hard to breathe, it's hard to use your voice, isn't it? Well, imagine living with a permanent mask from the age of 13 onwards. Some of us take it down for a breath of fresh air for a while, but are forced to put it back on just in case strangers splutter their words of hatred onto us. See, you will never know the feeling of holding your head down when you reach that area, clutching that backpack with the pride patch in towards you just in case anybody sees. I won't hold a girl's hand around you because I know that it makes you uncomfortable and that's just your opinion. You don't want to learn about my history in class because it is irrelevant. And that's just your opinion. You don't think we should fundraise for LGBTQ plus organizations because there are plenty of other problems in the world. And that's just your opinion. Well, I'm done listening to your opinion. When do I get to have my opinion? Or is that too offensive? Dear Ireland, Belong to gave me that space to be. But we need you. We need you to do better. Now, I'm not expecting you all to hang your rainbow flags from every window. I'm simply asking you to be aware of your tolerance. We're not something to be feared. 
for something to be acknowledged. We're human beings with minds and hearts and families. Now when will you accept us as your family too? me about this video, aside from Lara's uh, obvious talent and both writing and performing, is the mask that she talks about wearing from the age of 13 when she realised she was gay. And we know from 2016 research conducted by Trinity College that the average age for a young person to realise that they're LGBTQ plus is 12. We believe that in 2023 this age is actually lower. The same research also tells us that 16 is the most common age of coming out as LGBT, uh, as an LGBT young person. So we know that during these eight to be aiming four years, many young people like Lara wear a mask to hide their identity. And it can be a lonely and isolating time. And this period leading up to telling somebody or coming out can be particularly stressful as young people struggle with anxiety and a fear of rejection. This study also gave us evidence of the high incidence of self-harm, suicide ideation, anxiety and depression experienced by this cohort of young people. Compared to their non-LGBTQ plus peers, LGBTQ plus young people experienced two times the level of self-harm, three times the level of attempted suicide, and four times the level of extreme stress, anxiety and depression. I refer to these statistics almost every day in my work and it still shocks and upsets me. A growing body of research supports the theory that negative experiences resulting from LGBTQ plus stigma can lead to chronic stress and trauma that contributes to emotional distress amongst the LGBTQ plus population. So what I've shared with you paints a picture of what life can be like for LGBTQ plus young people growing up in Ireland. However, it doesn't need to be like this. And in Belong To, we've launched our Better Out Than In campaign five years ago it was born out of a challenge that presented to us in our Dublin Youth Service. We secured a partnership with Pieta to offer free counselling to LGBTQ plus young people who were self-harming or experiencing suicide ideation. And we knew from our groups that there was a large number of attendees who were suffering with their mental health and would fall within this, this group. Yet at the same time, there was a real reluctance and fear to engage with the support service. So we conducted some research by surveys and focus groups with young people and partnerships with our colleagues in the youth lab at Pink House to understand why, what, what was preventing them from seeking help, even when it was available, as they were experiencing pain. The findings showed us that LGBTQ plus young people wore masks before they came out, and that this served as a wonderful safety and coping mechanism to support them before they felt safe to tell anyone about their sexual orientation or gender identity. However, for many of them, this, they carried this coping <coughs> mechanism with them and used it to mask their mental health challenges, to hide how they were feeling, and therefore, unfortunately, it became a barrier for them to seek support. They also described to us about the fear they felt about coming out with experiencing anxiety, depression, or suicide ideation. They felt pressure that having come out as LGBT, that everything should be solved in a post marriage quality Ireland, and that they should feel good. They worried about telling their family members and loved ones about their mental health challenges when they had already burdened them with coming out. These findings informed our Better Out Than In campaign, which runs annually online and encourages young people to talk about their feelings with a loved one or a mental health professional. We direct them to a book on our website sharing mental health resources that they can access free of charge. This year, we decided to introduce a new element to the campaign, and this is what brings us here uh, together this morning. As well as letting LGBT plus young people know that there are services and supports available for them, it is critical that those delivering the services understand the specific experiences and needs of the LGBTQ plus community. So today, we are joined by a host of speakers with experience and expertise in the field of LGBTQ plus youth, mental health, and children's rights. Behind me on the screen, uh, 
Um, so behind me on the screen, um, what have we got? We've got um, uh, the, the running <coughs> order, um, which you can see that there's a 20 minute break at 10, 10 14. So tea and coffee will be available at the back of the room um, when the event ends at 1 um, p.m. and there will be an opportunity for us to chat and network over lunch together. So I'd ask everybody to turn off your phones and <coughs> silent for the duration of the event and just to draw your attention to the fire exits, the door you came in, and some here to, to my right. So if you'd like to share the event on social media, you can use the hashtag better out than in and please tag belong to. Unfortunately, as I discussed with some of you this morning, we have to ask you not to disclose the location of this event online for everybody's safety. As we commence proceedings, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Brendan Dunlop. Brendan is a principal clinical psychologist in the NHS and deputy director of research and a clinical lecturer in clinical psychology in the University of Manchester's Clinical Psychology Training Program. He's worked closely with our sister organization, Thrive Trust in Manchester. In 2022, he published the Queer Mental Health Workbook, a first of its kind LGBTQ plus self-help resource which I have a copy of in my office, and I absolutely love it, and so does Nash from, from Asia. We pour through the pages over it. Um, and I contacted Brendan um, as, as soon as I got my hands on a copy of the book, um, and then he's been a great support to us in our work in Belong To. So I'm really delighted that he has worked with us on this campaign this year, um, um, on the Better Out Than In campaign, and that he could join us here today. So can I invite you, uh, Brendan, to the stage to deliver an overview on mental health of LGBTQ plus young people. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you very much. That was a very grand introduction. That's very, very, very kind of you. Um, so, uh, hi folks, my name's uh, Brendan, um, so yeah, I um, hopped over the Irish Sea to come and uh, see you all, so thanks so much for having me, for being here with me. Um, so, I'm going to do a couple of uh, talks today, this one's about a bit more of an overview of the kind of uh, LGBTQ plus mental health uh, literature, theory, some kind of basic understandings and ideas that I think are really important for us to be aware of as practitioners or, or folks that work in this arena and a little bit later we'll do something hopefully a little bit more practical with um, uh, thinking a little bit about self-injury and self-harm with this particular group. So um, just a, a content warning more than anything, um, I might touch upon some topics which are tricky because we know that uh, young LGBTQ plus people experience tricky things as do of people, so um, you know there might be some brief discussion of self-harm, suicidality, trauma, eating difficulties, things like that. So I don't know anyone in this room at all really, so do what you need to do to keep yourself safe as well. And it's probably worth just uh, asking you to self-reflect a little bit on what your current knowledge, understanding and confidence I guess is when we think about some of the factors that contribute towards uh, lower mental health and well-being for this specific, specific population. Um, this is an hour, maybe just short of an hour, so I don't expect miracles, but I guess it might be useful for us to just think whether there's any subtle changes in your own confidence or, or, or comfort when thinking about this. So this is what I'm going to hopefully try and do. I'm aware as well, I'm very mindful when I do these types of talks, that sometimes I preach to a converted audience. So I'm sometimes talking to people that, that are on the side that I think we should be on as practitioners and youth workers and folks working with uh, queer youth. Though um, it's worth saying that some of the things I, I might touch upon might still be new, but also if they are common or familiar to you, that's perhaps a good thing as well. So, uh, just throwing that out there. So this is kind of what I'm hoping to do in this short hour. Um, a few different kind of ideas, some kind of theories, and um, yeah, I guess tips towards the end as well. Uh, and of course, because this is so short, during the break or during the lunch, we can talk more about this uh, together or uh, in, in small groups or whatever. So, um, 
again, because of folks in the room, I'm probably not going to linger too much on this slide, um, or the next slide, which is again a little bit more uh, some of the kind of uh, identifiers which are within this field. Um, and I guess that's because, well, the function of me putting this slide up is to say that language in this arena, as we all probably know, can be dynamic, it can be fast moving, and it can be changeable. So it's very, very normal for us as practitioners and folks working in this arena to sometimes not know what every word means. And I guess that means there's probably a responsibility for us to try and educate ourselves, but that initial sense of, oh gosh, what does that mean, is okay. Uh, so there's just another slide on that. Um, so I guess something I wanted to just ask the room, um, and these questions are for heterosexual people, so if you are heterosexual in the room, you are welcome to be here. It's, it's a safe space for you. Uh, but I wanted to just ask you a few questions. I wanted to ask at what age you decided that heterosexuality was the choice for you. Have you ever thought about changing that? Maybe through you know, mental health services or religious or cultural institutions? Why do you need to sometimes be so overt with that heterosexuality? Holding hands, kissing in public, things like that. Uh, and do you think you might grow out of it? Or at what age do you think you might grow out of it if this phase is going to linger? It can be tricky, can't it, to be a red apple amongst <coughs> lots of green apples. And those types of questions might be familiar to some people in the room. Some of those questions might seem trivial to some people in the room. And I guess I wanted to just draw our attention to the fact that sometimes the way in which stories and narratives are constructed and offered back to young LGBTQ plus people can be really tricky and can be really invalidating as well. Again, I'm not going to linger too much on this. I guess there's, there's, there's other things I want to come on to in this short time that I've got. But here's some statistics. So we know that we've had a, well, in the United Kingdom anyway, we've just had our 2021 census results, which for the first time asked about gender identity. Um, we know that around three and a half percent of the population reported on the census that they're LGBTQ plus though we know that's probably a vast underestimation of the actual figures. So if I, I'm not very good at statistics, but if I was to think about my mental health surgery and about three and a half percent of the population are LGBTQ+, in my very basic statistics I would expect probably three or four of those people in the room to be LGBTQ+. However, and Melinia touched upon this already, we know that's not the case. And the chances are there's a much greater slice of that waiting room that are from the LGBTQ plus community. We know that, again, and that's been touched upon already, suicide attempts, self-harm and self-injurious behavior, substance use, eating difficulties, mood difficulties, relationship and relational difficulties, they're all elevated, and we know this from multiple repeated studies, cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, interview studies. This is a common finding. Um, my research that I do and that I'm very interested in is bisexuality, and bisexual mental health, and um, particularly self-harm and self-injury. And We know that for bi people, my research was on young bisexual people between the ages of 16 and 20. We know that they have got a hugely elevated odds of engaging in self-injury and self-harm, even when compared to their gay and lesbian counterparts. So there are also individual nuanced differences and risk factors within different slices of the LGBTQ plus community. And that's why you might hear me using the term LGBTQ plus communities, plural today, because I think that's one of the takeaway messages that I think is really useful for us to be aware of, that there are lots of different groups within this umbrella. So that paper, I think, is what Lydia was 
was referred to as well about kind of, kind of some more island specific statistics as well. Um, so, um, as well, I kind of a slight disclaimer as well, just because sometimes people ask me this. I am using the term queer um, interchangeably with the term LGBTQ+. I guess I'm very, very aware of and I have lots of conversations with lots of my clients that are younger and also older about the connotations and the semantics associated with that term. Um, and I guess that's a term that I think uh, can be reclaimed, and I think that has been reclaimed in certain spheres, and that's why I'm using it. But if it's a term that feels uncomfortable for you, I wanted to just say that I do respect that, uh, and I hope that you might be able to respect me using this term as well. So, how am I growing up and living as, as a queer person, as a young or an older LGBTQ plus person? Because this is what we sometimes forget when we're in the youth field, is that young, Queer people grow up to be older queer people. So, how might it be challenging? Well, there's a whole plethora of reasons why this can be challenging. Difficulties with family, heteronormativity, abuse of various different kinds, bullying. When I say challenges to transition, I'm talking, okay, yes, social or medical transition, but also the transition between a child to a young person to an adolescent to a young adult, to an adult. Laws, policies that may be um, directly punitive against identity, but also some of those laws and policies that are a little bit more insidious and are a little bit more baked into the fabric, baked into the walls, we can't really grasp them because we know that they're not good. Social stories coming out, I put coming out in inverted commas because in, in the book, the Minimia in reference, I, I, I try and encourage people to reframe that really as a kind of embracing yourself experience rather than coming out because I think, you know, people have told me, and I, I identify this with, with this myself, that idea of coming out kind of really implies a hidden sense of you, which I think is not a connection, potentially it's a shame. So uh, embracing someone's identity is what I talk with my uh, young clients about. Social stories, the legacy of HIV and AIDS looms large today still. Um, the monkeypox um, or the mpox uh, outbreak recently really brought to the surface some of those narratives as well, both, again, subliminally, insidiously, but also quite explicitly. Um, certainly some of the kind of older clients that I have talked about parallels as well. Um, for the first time, I think it was last year or the year before, Rates of new diagnosis of HIV, some of you might already be aware in the room, rates of new diagnosis of HIV, certainly in England, um, it, it, sorry, in the heterosexual communities, surpassed that of the LGBTQ plus communities, new diagnoses. So that says that something about systemic and broader level change by healthcare and social care services can bring about of some kind of really tricky things within the, the, the queer communities. <coughs> Internalised homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, microaggressions, this term as well is contentious in the literature, microaggressions, especially when it comes to racial trauma, the idea that there's no such thing as a microaggression, it's an aggression, um, so it's worth saying that, that maybe uh, we need to hold that lightly.
can become very um, individually focused. Okay, you've got something going on for you, and therefore we need to support you to change it. Something that I talk a lot with people about, and I'm sure folks in the room, maybe in the work that you do with LGBTQ plus young people, is very much focused on some of that external stuff. And this is what I talk a lot when I'm in, in my role as training new clinical psychologists as something that's super, super important and that we need to be thinking about so much more than I think just focusing on individual stuff. So, here's an example of what I call the circles of influence. Those of you in the room that maybe know about psychology or clinical psychology, I don't know what people's backgrounds are, you might uh, remember or be familiar with the name Ron von Brenner, uh, the ecological systems theory. Some people are nodding their heads, okay, good. This is very much based on Ron von Brenner's theory. So this is just adapted ever so slightly to a potentially more modern or more contemporary context. So, for example, if someone's sitting in front of me and is saying, oh, why do I have to be so different? Why, why am I not normal? That's what a young person might be talking to us about. But if we then zoom out and start to think about this first circle, these teachers, families, friends, groups of people around them, we start to then get an understanding of some of the stories and some of the kind of um, language that's being used you know, my God, I'm not doing that, that's so gay, you know, I wish my daughter was normal, this LGBT stuff wasn't around when I was a kid. Some of these things are then floating around. Kids are very perceptive, as we all know. But then, if we think even broader, with a slightly more compassionate lens, I think, as well, why are some of these parents and teachers and, you know, leaders within our community maybe thinking like this as well? Well, actually, if we zoom out again and we think about the social narrative, mass media, social media, the law, pop culture, all these types of things, suddenly we then start to see, oh well, hang on a minute, gay marriage might be illegal in this person's home country. Or there's a media misrepresentation of trans women as uh, predators or something like this. TV adverts not representing diversity in family structure. No relationship, education, or sex ed that's specific to LGBTQ plus people in schools. So when we zoom out again and we go, oh, I can kind of see maybe why these parents and people are starting to think in the way that they are. So suddenly we, we have this understanding that this young person, <coughs> it's nothing about them being different or weird or strange. It's about this whole world being different, weird, and strange. And when I've done this exercise, that exercise in itself is what I've done with people over several sessions. And sometimes they say to me that doing something like that has been more useful to them than doing eight sessions or 12 sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy because it just takes that weight off their shoulders. It makes them go, yeah, do you know what? Everything else is the problem, it's not me. And that kind of sense of realization, that shared understanding of how they've got to where they are can be really liberating. So, you know, if you want to talk more about that later, I can talk to people more about how to use that. But I think that's a really lovely exercise that Ron from Brenner kind of started to introduce to us all the way back in the 30s, 1935. So again, this is a slide that I could probably linger on for a very long time. Apologies that this screen doesn't look like it's translated this super, super well. So if you're squinting a little bit, I do apologize. That's not your eyes, that is maybe the screen. But I wanted to just orientate people to systems of oppression that operate around us and that can become internalized within us. So heteronormativity, this pervasive idea that, um, you know, kind of heterosexual relationships and heterosexual ways of life are the, the right way of doing things. Patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism, socioeconomic division, these are all systems that are set up and enacted around us that keep certain groups oppressed. And I think it's really important for us to be holding that in mind when we're working with people, because as I'm sure a lot of people maybe in this room have as well, <coughs> if you're working with a young person or a family that are using a food bank and that have got difficulties with their neighbours because of racism and they can't get to a GP or doctor appointments because they can't pay to get there and they can't use, I don't know, there's, there's some accessibility issues. That's not a them problem, that is a system problem, that is these various systems of oppression that are keeping those people in a really 
pressed position. And of course, they're going to have rubbish mental health because we know that these things interact with us and make us feel like it's, it's us, when actually it's not all in their head. This is, this is a much wider thing. So I want to put that on there as a, as a kind of way of us thinking to ourselves, when we're working with people, what systems of oppression are operating? Because again, sometimes just naming them, I've found to be really powerful with people. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about what I think our role is as well, <laughs> as therapists and uh, uh, youth workers and stuff, all ones that. So you might have seen something like this before, this kind of wheel of power and privilege. Again, this I think is really, um, really important. This is socially constructed, by the way. There's no objectivity to this. There's nothing about um, being white and able-bodied, which is intrinsically better than being black or brown or and or disabled. There's nothing objectively that proves that. This is all about how society is constructed and set up. And people that are in powerful positions decide sometimes what is and isn't powerful and privileged. So that's how privilege works. Again, another metaphor. The more of those privileged identities someone has, I guess they can they, they can take off more physically and metaphorically. So um, you know sometimes when when people talk about being queer and white, and they talk about oppression. Yes, they're being oppressed in one way, but it's also a part of their identity which they are privileged for. And I think that's what we need to orientate ourselves to when we're thinking about our own biases and our own assumptions, but also holding in mind when working with our clients and the families that we come across. So minority stress theory is one of the big theories in this arena. Minority stress theory is largely attributed to someone called Ilian Mayer, who's a man. But Ilian Mayer did not coin minority stress theory. It was coined by a lesbian woman called Virginia Brooks in the 80s. Virginia is not cited hardly at all for minority stress theory. I think that the citations of her work is about 480 citations to Ilian Mayer's hundreds of thousands of citations. So it's worth just saying if anyone is uh, thinking about minority stress theory or citing this in the future, please cite Virginia Brooks as well. So this is the basic premise that being a, um, um, this was originally for sexuality, being a sexual minority is an inherently stressful experience because you've got to manage stressful things that are a little bit over there that might come close, but also things that are already close and potentially Term. So, prejudice might be a kind of um, distal stress that's a little bit further away, but then internalised homophobia or biphobia or internalised transphobia is a proximal stressor. It's a little bit closer to you, it's more proximal, closer proximity. So, here's the model if you're interested in this. <laughs> this is a little bit kind of um, wordy. But just this idea that, yeah, when we have a minority uh, identity and we experience some of these stresses, it can lead to poorer mental health. And if we've got some strengths and some resilience factors and some good things in our life, it can buffer that a little bit. Um, and here, Now this might lead to some of those proximal stresses, some of those things that are a bit closer to you. You might have that sense of internalised homophobia, but you also might become quite vigilant, you know, this overactivity of what we call the fight or flight response. So the mental health consequences of this might be that someone feels quite anxious, you know, they might think, oh god, everyone's looking at me because I'm, because I'm gay. But there also might be relational difficulties.
the system then develop. This idea that someone might not be consciously aware of, but because of that hypervigilance and the difficulties with their relationship with family, they might be kind of falling into a pattern of, right, well, hang on a minute, if I get in there first and push you away, I won't feel as bad when you ultimately reject me, which is what, what they might think might happen. But this might be buffered slightly as well. So we might get a little bit of um, give in this, in that this person might have a small group of friends that they're really close to, and they might be connected to the gay community through the internet. So there might be a few things that kind of mitigate against some of those challenges. Now the minority stress theory is criticized quite a lot. And that is because it's pro predominantly a deficit-based approach. What's all these things that are wrong with you? <laughs> and it doesn't really talk too much about those resilience and protective factors and how to integrate them. Uh, it's mostly <laughs> correlational when, when, when studies have tried to look at implementing this particular model. But also something that was um, a, a big criticism of this was what's what's the um, what's the ingredient? What's the um, causal mechanism? How do we end up with these stressors and then we've got the mental health difficulties? What, what happens in between that leads us to that? Um, so there is something, perhaps in view of the psychological mediation framework, was something that was offered for people, if you're interested in this, in this field, to kind of uh, counter that critique by saying, all right, what happens is those stressful things that someone experiences doesn't just automatically lead to mental health difficulties, but it increases other general psychological processes like rumination, worry, going over things over and over again in your mind, emotional dysregulation, feeling like big feelings and not knowing what to do with them. It increases that, and that is what leads to your mental health difficulties. So, Pat and Bula try to kind of buff that out a little bit more, which I think is probably closer to what's actually going on. This is something I came across really recently, and I spoke to Lisa Diamond on Zoom um, months ago about this, and we were thinking that we were gonna try and do something research-wise to test this. But um, Lisa Diamond and her co colleague, Jenna Ali, I think, um, came up with this social safety theory as a more contemporary framework for kind of LGBTQ plus people. This idea that actually social safety, reliable connection, inclusion, protection, that a group, and a community gives you is so important. And it's maybe something that if we trace our history back hundreds of thousands of years, they got really right with you know group living, group being, you know, caring for each other. And actually, some communities around the world, especially some communities maybe in Africa and parts of Asia, where there is a communal sense of caring, work really well. So in this theory, the idea is that the absence of social safety, so not having that kind of um, invisible shield of connection to other people, has just as many consequences as some of those distal and proximal stresses. So actually, even if you don't get that overt prejudice or this kind of difficulty with your identity concealment quite a lot, the absence, the felt absence of this uh, lack of social safety is really, really important. Um, and this is because, they say in the theory, this increases our vigilance for threat. If we don't feel like we're safe in a group, what was that noise? Is that person going to do something? You haven't got the group as someone to, uh, as, as a unit to support you. And then, Lisa Diamond and Jenna Ali said, what this then means is that because we're chronically always looking for threat, because we haven't got this social safety, our immune system is working overdrive, and we're much more vulnerable to physical illnesses and psychological challenges. So they, in the paper, <laughs> kind of summarise their, their, their paper in that last line, is the absence of social safety just as harmful as distal or proximal stresses? But this is just a theory, so this hasn't been tested well yet. That's why Lisa Diamond and I were saying, why don't we try and test that? Uh, I think Lisa's already started to test it. So Lisa's in the States. I already started to test it on college students, I think in Arizona, where she works. Um, 
but we need to actually test whether maybe using saliva samples or blood samples or something actually, when there is the absence of social safety and we can try and control for that, does that actually have a physiological change? Lisa says it does from the preliminary evidence that she's got. But this is really important for us to think about when we're working with young people, about the groups and the communities that they're connected to, because this could be really, really important. Now, some people in the room might be familiar with cognitive behavioral theory and therapy. Um, good, there's some nods, so I maybe won't linger on this too long. Basic premise, thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations are connected, they interact, and they are influenced by each other. This originally came from the 60s. This was um, Aaron Beck thinking about low mood depression. This was where it originally came from. This has been extended to lots of different mental health challenges. Um, I mean, Podesky and Mooney kind of thought about this hot cross bun. So actually, they, they, they centralized this idea of physical sensations a little bit more, which was absent from the original um, theory. Um, so yeah, here's a young person that we might be working with, doesn't want to go to school, feels uh, really scared, and is, has got a real tight chest, heart beating very fast, a bit shaky and sweaty. <coughs> they might avoid school by playing video games. Great, that gets rid of those, uh, those feelings, they don't feel as scared anymore, they're a bit distracted. The next morning they wake up, they don't want to go to school again. They go play their video games, they feel better. So the video games becomes their kind of safety behavior, if you like, for, uh, for these sensations and feelings. However, a big problem I've got with CBT, and by the way, just to, uh, as a disclosure, I am, um, I, I put my application in to be a content behavioral uh, therapist <laughs> with the BABCP, which is the accrediting body. So I think CBT is really useful, but I do have difficulties with it in the sense of this focus when we are maybe not using CBT flexibly, that it's all about your faulty thinking and your incorrect thoughts, which I guess when clinicians are stretched for time and are trying to figure out what's going on for someone can sometimes be the assumption we, or the conclusion that we arrive at. That can be really tricky if they're grounded in reality. If someone's being bullied and they've got these thoughts and they don't want to go to school, Bloody hell, that's not a faulty thought, that is a, a safety mechanism. So it's very individually focused as well. You know, change your situation and you'll feel better. But there is a central role with those circles of influence, with Rob from Brenner's ideas in the 30s about systems around us, that context is really important. How do these thoughts arrive in our minds? They don't just pop in. They're developed over time. So actually, changing this avoidant or maladaptive behavioral responses that people have, is it really a maladaptive response? Do we need to not consider what that's doing for the person in the context of their life? And a big issue I have is that if you pick up any CBT paper, and I encourage you to try this, that gives some kind of assertion, CBT works for social anxiety. It works. Crack on. You can do CBT for social anxiety. Look at the population that they recruited for that. I'm going to guess it was probably a young university, white, middle class, female sample. It's the guess I'm going to give you. And that it's probably not got a huge uh, chunk of LGBTQ plus people in it. If it has, they certainly haven't asked about it. So I always say to people, when we're looking at guidelines and when we're looking at um, research evidence recommendations, they're usually based on populations that are not LGBTQ+. So is it really going to be helpful in its, in its current form for the population that we're interested in? My feeling is no, probably not. It's going to need some kind of adaptation. So it's worth us bearing that in mind when, when, when people maybe say to us, but you must be doing CBT for OCD. You must be doing CBT for this, that or the other. Certain samples, it's going to work for, but not everyone. Until there's a, a huge, massive sample of 200,000 people and there's a huge representation of lots of different groups, 
and we still get the same result, maybe then we can say, okay, got it. So there you go, that's just what I think is really important. This is, this is the type of, um, uh, what's it called, model that I use when I'm working with people, is that I always try and have those circles outside that hot cross bowl. Because I think if we can try and just catch what's going on outside, we draw lots of lines together, we sometimes use green lines for the things which are connecting which are good, we use red lines for the things that are not so good, it then gives us a little bit of a visual map. I might say to the other person, God, this, is, this looks great. So all these red lines, which ones do we want to change? Which ones do you think we can maybe flip up a little bit and uh, try and do something differently? So I think, um, this is really important, <laughs> basically. That's my, that's my personal opinion, that just doing this kind of really helps to contextualize CBT a little bit more. Okay, so here's an example. So that person before, I didn't want to go to school, so let's do the circles of influence with them. So suddenly we find out that they've got no gender neutral bathrooms, that's really stressful for them at school. The curriculum's not inclusive, so the curriculum's not talking about any difference, and the teachers don't challenge transphobia when it crops up in lessons. If we zoom out further, you know, we would think, okay, you know, maybe in a, in a UK context, again, sorry I use that just because that's what I'm most familiar with, that idea of section 28, okay, I can kind of maybe understand why the teachers are a bit more reticent, the older teachers perhaps, but still, for this young person, that lack of challenge is really um, stressful. So of course, they're not going to want to go to school if this is what's going on. So if I was looking at this with someone, I'd be thinking to myself, I need to be having a conversation with school. It's no use me working with this young person in isolation, which I'm sure most of us don't usually do anyway, but I need to be targeting my intervention primarily at a different level. And I'll talk very briefly about that later. So um, here's another example. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to this a little bit later as well when we start to think about um, self-harm and self-injury specifically. But here's an example of the CBT circles of influence for self-harm. So someone that thinks that they can't cope anymore, um, they feel rejection, they feel sad, they feel really angry as well in the world. It's a really common feeling that people get, um, especially young queer people. They might, they, might, uh, they might feel their heart beating very fast, they've got these bubbling feelings inside of them, they don't know what to call that. They might burn themselves using a the lighter. And actually, if we zoom out a little bit and we try to understand what's going on, this person might be being bullied at school. So that's obviously linking a little bit to their feelings of not being able to cope, feeling like they haven't got much control over situations perhaps. Their mum is not accepting of their identity at home. So of course that's going to compound and interact with that rejection and that sadness and the anger. Bloody hell, mum, one of the people that I thought I could rely on in life, you're not, you're not doing anything about this. But also this person might have read somewhere that being a lesbian is wrong. I don't know where they might have read that, but they might have read it. So yeah, again, they're being told now by multiple different sources that, that being different is not the right way to do things. And also this person has been on social media, has read or read comments or watch videos of other people saying, this works, by the way, I've done it and it works. So, okay, they've tried it because they've read that. So again, zooming out a little bit is really important for us to understand what's going on, because again, that might then give me different ideas as a therapist, as a practitioner, where I might be wanting to intervene with this person. So let's think a little bit about help seeking, because I guess campaign this year, it's all about helping to uh, connect with help seeking um, within queer youth and to think about what might be the challenges to that. So I've just kind of summarised, I think, what some of the challenges might be to help seeking if we were considering all those different theoretical type positions. Um, minority stress theory, yeah, that, that cumulative minority stress can create multiple barriers. Of course it can. Fear of being stigmatised again, fear of more rejection, internalised hom homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, blaming yourself, of course that's going to bring up that mask that's been talked about earlier. Social safety theory, dis feeling disconnected. We know as well with suicide, one of the 
biggest things with suicide is feeling like you're a burden, feeling lonely and disconnected. You know, those are huge variables associated with the suicidality picture. Um, so actually, it's a lack of physical or psychological safety to talk about your difficulties. Of course, it's going to be difficult to ask about. Cognitive behavioral theory. Are there some thoughts that are popping into people's minds, whether they are kind of thoughts that they're aware of or intrusive thoughts, that actually doesn't matter, what's the point, it's never going to get any better, do we need to think about helping people to name some of these thoughts? And, you know, is that a thought that's popping into your mind automatically? You know, is it a thought that feels comfortable for you? And also, yeah, again, that avoidant behaviour, becoming self-reinforcing, don't talk to someone about it, be a little bit less anxious in that moment, that then keeps the cycle of not talking going. And then these systems of oppression that I touched upon earlier, and that's also worth us just thinking a little bit about, because, yeah, that internalised sense of blame that you're the problem is what these kind of systems lead us to think. Policies and procedures maybe don't make it easy for, for people to reach out and ask for support. Classic situation if you've got to fill out a form and then that form's got to be checked by someone and someone else has then got to check it and then you've got to fill out another form just to get an appointment or something like that. You're going to think, what's the point? I'm not doing it. So thinking about policies and procedures is really important. Heteronormative, cisnormative frameworks in my NHS role, I talk to people a lot about this. How do we make sure that we are not operating from a potentially oppressive position, whether we're aware of it or not? And yeah, what if actually healthcare providers or health and social care services are part of the problem? If they are, of course, people are not going to feel safe to engage with them. So, I guess, just thinking a little bit about pulling together some of those, those theories, because I realise it's been, been quite theory heavy, but that's just to kind of to give you an overview of some of the kind of key things in this arena. These systems of oppression, which I guess include minority stresses, they include that lack of social safety, or you know, inclusion of social safety, plus the external environment, so plus those circles of influence around the person, I think can lead to mental health challenges, but also mental health opportunities if some of this stuff is good around people. So there you go, the thoughts, apologies if that's a little bit small, um, Thoughts of what's wrong with me, this must be my fault, why does no one love me, I hate that I'm different. These thoughts might be understandable within the context of these, these higher level things. Feeling rejected, alone, different, really angry. And then survival strategies. Those of you in the room that might be familiar with compassion focused therapy, or you might have heard of compassion focused therapy, will understand that CFT talks a lot about. Un, like unintended consequences and you know what's what's happened that actually you maybe didn't expect was going to happen because you were trying your best but what what's the unintended consequence of this so actually some of these survival strategies of what will make me feel better you know how can i survive who can i blame as well which is a common thing people come across these can have unintended consequences emotional dysregulation might result use of substances might result of that um, interpersonal difficulties with family or friends might come as a result of some of these tricky thoughts and feelings when people are just trying to do things to survive. So existence can be overwhelming and traumatic for some people. And I think that's probably important for us to hold in mind as well that actually, especially at the moment with kind of trans non-binary and gender non-conforming folk, it's a kind of really hostile place for some people to be at the moment. But because of this, it means our resources to be able to implement change ourselves can be really dim diminished, which means that these systems of oppression and challenges around us keep going. So there's almost, that the people that have got the resource, the people that have got a bit of uh, juice in your battery is maybe what the, the people that need to be doing things about this. This same cycle, you can replace some of these words with um, being a minoritized ethnicity, being a minoritized um, a, a, a kind of disabled person. You can replace this with lots of other identifiers, and this, this system of, of, of oppression is probably um, 
of this cycle of the question, I should say, is probably pretty similar. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, LGBTQ plus mental health is multi-layered and it's contextual, I think. Some of these social stories about different historical and intergenerational trauma, these traumas that other people have experienced that pass down in hearts and minds, they're, 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 they're passed down in, in, in the way that people are brought up, the way that they bring up people, um, the way that they care perhaps, and the policies, the, the structures, the laws that exist around us. This leads to certain things, this felt sense of violence, this actual threat of violence, internalised homophobia or transphobia, rejection or marginalisation. So of course, I don't think it's wild for us to then say, of course we'll see people feeling suicidal, of course we'll, be, we'll listen to people's stories and wanting to feel some semblance of control, of course they'll use substances or they'll <clears throat> hear voices of people that have been mean to them in the past. This to me feels understandable. And this is what I was saying earlier, um, I'm almost at the end by the way folks, so just a few more slides on this. Um, the level of intervention I think is really, really important. And certainly as, um, for those of you that are therapists or that are mental health practitioners, um, I think it's important for us, and adjunct workers, <coughs> I think a lot of us, it's important to remind ourselves that mental and physical health care is political. A lot of people say, well, I'm not about politics here, I don't bring, bring politics into my work. I think unfortunately, everything we do is political, <laughs> whether we want to acknowledge that or not. So, um, therefore, what therapy and the mental health care is provided is political. So the golden thread that I think is really important to consider with any uh, psychological skill or interventional technique is that level of intervention. Does this need to be at an individual level? Does it need to be at a family level? Does it need to be at a community or group level? Does it need to be at a system level? So actually, for someone that, that, that presents uh, to me or whatever, and you know, we're, we're working with that person, and we realize there's something about the service that is getting in the way. As a service, we need to try and make changes, reasonable changes, to make sure that, that doesn't happen again. So targeting at the wrong level, I think, can have implications for the self-blame, it's all me, what have I done wrong? Um, so there you go, I'm a big advocate that we should consider our role as not just constrained to the therapy room. I think our role is sometimes broader. Um, I think there are some practitioners in the mental health sphere that do this very, very well. And I think there are some practitioners that maybe because of training modalities and things like that, people um, kind of stick with the one-to-one -one individual work. But I think when we work with minoritized and oppressed groups, the normal way of working is not what we need to be doing because that's that's can be viewed as an oppressive way of working as well. So I probably don't need to talk too much about this. I guess with the audience that I'm working uh, or talking to, you know, challenging oppression, being a good ally. There are there are lots of things that we can do as as humans, as a people. If someone tells you about sexuality or they're questioning their sexuality and gender. Listen, don't make assumptions, don't invalidate. Um, I also used to, I remember um, a while ago, someone would, would like tell me about as I being gay or trans or something like that. And I'd go, oh wow, you know, thanks, you know, that's that's great. You know, how do you feel about that? And I, I, I kind of came to realise that actually my response was maybe not helpful because they might have gone, oh yeah, actually, hang on a minute. This 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 was a bigger thing than I thought. So I've just kind of subtly changed my, my behaviour and the language I use to just, you know, thanks for feeling comfortable to tell me, you know, if you want to talk about it, we can, but I know that it can be difficult to embrace this. And I kind of, I kind of leave it something like that, and sometimes people go, yeah, do you know what, it has been really tricky to think about this. And then we might start a conversation about it. So, little uh, changes like this. Um, if someone tells you about abuse, you know, ensure safety and think about next steps. Inclusive social events, so you know, um, making events not totally alcohol oriented because we know that for LGBTQ plus people, alcohol is uh, a big difficulty. We, um, 
I think alcohol is used as a, as a social defense mechanism anyway, but particularly with uh, queer people, it is used as a way of feeling, sometimes feeling something, sometimes numbing and feeling nothing, but also as a way to try and connect with people. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, challenge discrimination, I think it's our role and responsibility to challenge things interpersonally, structurally, systemically. Questions that I try and encourage teams to think about is who are we overlooking? Um, you know, who are we oppressing? Which voices are missing from this discussion? Use inclusive language, and that's really important. So I used to say guys a lot of the time, which I know people think that's quite a gender neutral term, but I, I, I switch a little more to folks now just because I think it might be, it might be more inclusive for some. Um, pronouns, again, I think it's really important. Sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, I'm very obviously a man or something, so why don't you talk about pronouns? I work in academia. That's one of my roles. And there's lots of fantastic women professors that I work <coughs> with. And some of them have names like Alex. Professor Alex, so-and-so. Now, the amount of times they say to me, I'm misgendered and people assume that I'm a man because my name is Alex. So actually, though that person including their pronouns in their email signature or whatever helps them, as cisgender women, not be misgendered. So actually, there's this kind of idea of intersectional liberation, which I could stand here and talk to you about for another hour, <laughs> uh, but we don't have time to do that, where we, we liberate one group, we actually liberate multiple groups. So it's important for us to hold that in mind. Don't assume and advocate. We're in positions of power, I think. It's our responsibility to sometimes, again, we've got the juice in our battery. It's maybe for us to be the people that say, hang on a minute, this needs to change. So we need to really uh, grab that and, and wrestle with that. Um, so this is the book that was mentioned earlier. There might be, there might be some copies knocking around here. Um, I think the publisher are going to send us some, but we're just figuring out whether they have actually sent them um, <laughs> and whether they are in the building. So there might be some available to get healthy, but if not, you can get on. So, it might just be worth thinking to yourself a little bit about your knowledge, your confidence, your, your levels of comfort thinking about these variables and these ideas for um, LGBTQ plus uh, mental health and well-being for young people. Uh, whether that's changed at all, we've only had an hour, but whether that maybe has changed at all would be really self-reflective activity I think and then I'm sure these slides are going to be sent to you afterwards as well so um, you will definitely get these but there's a whole bunch of references well there's yeah a couple of couple of pages of references there if you want to read about any of this um, if you if you like to read academic papers I, I don't really love to read academic papers but some people do um, so they are on there if you would like that um, that's everything for me I don't know if we've got any time for any questions um, if we do, we can always have some, or we can always have a lovely chat during the break, or have any questions during the break. But, um, that's done. <laughs>
from shouting, I know I'm closing, I'm getting a teacher for the intersectional liberation on it, straight after this. Now, and I really believe Ian Power, who is CEO of, of Spill Out to the Stage. He's also um, just recently been appointed as a young professor um, in UCD at uh, School of Psychology. Um, so congratulations, Ian. Um, he is a tireless advocate around youth medical health, and I think many of you will already know him. Um, he's been a huge supporter of our work and belong to, and then to me personally as well. And I'm so delighted that he's kindly agreed to moderate the panel for us today, which will look at LGBTQ. Mental health and health seeking behavior. Thanks so much, Melinda. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, this is uh, an issue and a group of young people that are very close to uh, my own heart and my own uh, personal lived experience. So uh, it's great to be here talking about it. And um, I think Brendan's keynote this morning was just absolutely fascinating in terms of how. It's reframed that I think for lots of us often maybe we are aware of it or perhaps we're too zoomed in sometimes to, to get that, that wider lens on things. So I'm delighted that we've got a really esteemed uh, panel to discuss all of those issues and maybe to delve into everything a little bit more this morning. So I'd like to invite them up to the stage if they want to join us and uh, I'll introduce as we go. Um, first, we have uh, Niall Muldoon, Dr. Niall Muldoon, who's the Ombudsman for Children. Niall has been the Ombudsman for Children since he was appointed by uh, President Michael B. Higgins in 2015. He has a background in clinical psychology and prior to working for the OCO, he was National Director of the Carrier Foundation, a charity that provides therapy and support to children affected by sexual abuse. And uh, we also have uh, Nash Zvigarabba. Uh, Nash is a psychotherapist and she is uh, a clinical director of Beacon Counseling as well as working for Pia House in particular. Nash runs the clinic would belong to specifically supporting LGBTQ plus uh, young people in crisis. So it's brilliant to have you today, Nash. Uh, we also then have Tara, Tara Mulhern. Tara is the clinical lead for education, specifically working um, on further and higher education in Jigsaw, uh, which is the National Centre for Youth Mental Health. Uh, she's an occupational therapist with 16 years of experience, so I'm really excited to hear more about what you've got to say, Tara. And obviously we have uh, Dr. Brendan Dunlop as well, Principal Clinical Psychologist at NHS, and we're so pleased that you're with us today, Brendan. Thank you so much uh, for, for what you've contributed already this morning. Um, we're going to and the first thing that obviously uh, belongs to your running sites is that young people, having come out, you know, if they're experiencing that a mental health difficulty after that, they feel, um, you know, self stigma. But I think in the reframing that we've kind of journeyed on this morning, I'd love for the panel to perhaps reflect on that and, and maybe kind of tease that out and unpack it a little bit. Um, because sometimes LGBTQ plus young people then, having gone through that process of coming out, feel maybe self-stigma or pressure to be happy, to have everything sorted, and actually life should be great now, but actually, you know, based on, on, on what Brendan has been sharing with us this morning, there's so many other factors at play here. Um, so maybe I'll just ask the panel to reflect on that first before we kind of delve uh, a little deeper. So now I don't know if you'd be happy to, to open it and, and share some of your reflections on that. So, so give it a go. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. This morning was fantastic. Thank you, Brendan. It was a really insightful and, and stimulating talk. I suppose I reflect on that sort of concept. And I wonder, are we overselling the coming out fantasy? You know, um, we, we see the stories that the hearts and roses, my mother put around around me, she, she said that, and she said, I knew that years ago. There's a lot of that, and that's hugely important to hear. But like every transition and every part step in your life, if you get married, it's not hearts and roses either. If you fall in love, it's not hearts and roses all the time. If you have become pregnant, it's not hearts and roses all the time. So maybe we just, as it's a term to say that we need to be realistic when you're talking about a 12 to 16 year old period. But I think we need to give the message that that was, would not be the only step you have to take. You will not always be immediately happy as a result of that. 
So I'm not quite sure how we message that, but I do think for me, if this question had not come off me, I never, until I saw this question uh, ahead of the conference, I had thought that we would have young people who managed to go the, through that step. And I'm assuming had a positive reaction. Let's start with that. Let's assume that everybody positively reacted. And they then felt, okay, that's it, I can do no more. I cannot possibly speak about this again. Mm -hmm. That's heartbreaking for me. Because again, for me, as children's almost on somebody's job is to promote and protect children's rights, you have the right to seek help. You have the right to not be healthy and to get the best possible help. And the message should always be, it doesn't matter whether you, you've come out and you're, whatever the issue is, if you're still feeling unhappy, your job and our job as a society is to promote you to seek help. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, you could, it could come out and your problem could be depression, regardless of what, the, what, what you come out about. Mm -hmm. Our society says, that's okay, speak about it. And again, we, we've done a bit of work in, in the Ellen's um, office last year in, in preparation for the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. We did a survey of 5,000 children. And it was very clear that there was extra additional pressures and issues and stressors for these young people in the LGBTQ area. But one of the things, again, as ever, children are, are the, the best at coming up with solutions. And one of the main solutions was you've got to get us help earlier. It's got to be available within schools. We've got to create a society and an openness to us saying, here's my issue, help me now, as opposed to here's my issue, six months from now, 12 months from now. You know, and again, I know from working in the area of sexual abuse, secrets are the killer. Anything you have to keep secret about is what sucks the life out of you. When you talk about toxic, that's where it comes from. It's a vibe that seeps within you, right? Keeping the secret then I'm not at my best. And we as a country, unfortunately, as a society, we talk about the wider circle of Ireland and shame and religion. We have hundreds of years of knowing how to keep people quiet and hide their secrets. So when a young person has done such a big step come forward and come out, we really have to be much more open and inviting to them, of, regardless of what you come out, whether you come out because of Sorry, I'm physically active and sexually active, so those coming out, let's talk about that. Let's be aware and be open to it. So it's, it's heartbreaking to hear, but hopefully by saying it, I know we can now start to make it easier for those in the future. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's not just one conversation that you have at that moment where you're, you're coming out, it's actually a continual piece where you're going to need to talk about this a lot because if you have if you have recognized who you are and kept that to yourself for whatever period, whether it's a few months, a few years, or whatever, there's an unpacking there that has to be done. And so you're going to naturally have to talk about that. So that initial relief uh, is often kind of maybe perhaps what is driving maybe that sense of I should be okay. And, and really kind of that, that there is a lot of romanticizing of, of that going out now at the moment, which is something that perhaps that we have to, to counter a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that, that ongoing engagement is, is what kind of spread puts out those different circles you then engage and you're coming out on a regular basis on a regular basis. Yeah. There's more opportunities to come out and that each one of them is pressurized, I would, yeah. I would guess. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a it's a conversation worth starting with. Absolutely. I'd like to come back to you a little bit just about that piece around that systemic element and how we can get access to people maybe normalize that health seeking process for children earlier so that actually it's not a process of, of kind of taking bigger steps later. Nash, I really want to talk to you uh, about your practice and kind of, you know, in supporting LGBT plus young people and reflecting perhaps a little bit about what Brighton was talking about earlier. Um, you know, a lot of the time we're thinking about, you know, the, the feelings that are experienced by LGBTQ plus young people and that CBT approach can just address those feelings, but actually how much of your work and how much of the presentations that you come across, it's fundamentally actually that systemic oppression. It's the environment, it's not the young person themselves. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today, Lydia. Um, this is amazing. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, in my practice, I work for Piedia House, so we collaborate with the Arm2 and we offer crisis counseling for young people, um, GSRD young people. 
So in relation to your question, what I find, sorry, could you just repeat your question? Yeah, just, just in terms of the presentations that you see, in terms of the young people who are coming to you through, belong to, uh, to be in a house, but it, you know, in terms of what we were talking about this morning and, and that systemic oppression, that environmental piece, you know, often we're, you know, we're reflecting on how feelings are, are uh, you know, individual as opposed to actually a lot of the driver behind some of this, uh, this stigma and this, this kind of, you know, overwhelm is actually to do with the system and, and, and the environment as opposed to the people themselves. All the time. All the time. Interestingly, I was having a conversation with Kashia, who is my life manager, yesterday, and we talked about that, that when it comes to young people coming in, uh, especially when it comes to the idea of coming out, it's the aftermath of coming out. So they may tell their parents or they may disclose to a teacher or an adult in their life, but what tends to happen then is they are rejected or they are not taken seriously or the answers that are given will be like it's just their face, things like that. Those are most of the presentations that they tend to come to because they feel then that they have come out and there's that pressure that they need to be okay, but then they're not feeling okay because nothing is changing in the environment, because the environment continues to uh, be quite heteronormative, continues to, you know, not to validate their existence, their experience, even something as simple as um, their pronouns. That's one of the biggest things, especially when it comes to home, and sometimes they might not want to use their name, they need to change their name, the parents dismissing that, not even having a conversation around that, and issues in schools as well. So, so at school, especially the single-sex schools, some kids, they don't want to come out because if they come out, they may be asked to leave school. So all of those things, what they tend to do then is they have to um, repress whatever else that they are feeling. So when they go to school, they go to school as the gender that they were born into, they are hiding their true self, and then, you know, all of that will cause, I think, the rumination that we were talking about earlier on, you know, not feeling good within their self, that sense of self, it really, really diminishes. And that invalidation, how do you, <coughs> it, I assume that's the first thing you have to unpack, right? It's that actually this is nothing, as Brendan was talking about earlier, nothing to do with you, this is about everybody else, and, and you and who you are is the most important thing. Is that something that you, you experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the practices that we use, uh, the, mod the modalities that we use would be very much to validate. Um, so the act is to validate. Um, acceptance, commitment therapy, it's very much validating the person, validating that they are, you know, their experiences are real, that also their being is actually so important, it's important as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Tara, and Jigsaw, you know, in terms of the LGBT plus young people that are coming forward, um, what are some of the kind of the, the common issues that are coming to you and what do you experience in terms of, is there any delay between, you know, the onset of maybe how someone is feeling and then actually <coughs> them presenting for help and support based on maybe that this kind of self stigma of, I should actually be fine, I should be okay. Um, yeah, I suppose first of all, thank you again for having me. Delighted um, to be here today. Uh, thanks for, for the lovely welcome. Um, in terms of what you do things there, first the, the kind of common issues and the things that, that, that they're facing. Um, you know, when Brenton spoke earlier, you, know, you talked about the challenge of transitions and um, in the broadest sense of the word. And young people, you know, in Jigsaw, we work with age 12 to 25, all young people in that age range have a huge number of transitions and we see a peak in young people coming into Jigsaw, you know, with that transition into secondary school, transition out of secondary school, into college and so on. And then you have the, you know, so you have that for everyone and then you have the added transitions and the, the added challenges um, that come with, with being the LGBTI communities. Um, so uh, I suppose transitions is, is a huge thing in general in the broadest sense of the word. And um, that idea of, you know, that, that, that stigma, I suppose, as well, that, that comes, and that delay that comes, and, um, you know, young people, definitely, there is 
the delight in them coming to us and you know that that research and like they'll be my dead one first to 12 and, and coming into someone at 16 that's just coming into one person at 16 as well so that's just the very very start and um, so absolutely that's a delay and you know young people tell us um that stigma and also um i suppose poor mental health literacy or not not being able to actually identify and name what's going on for them and their mental health are two of the main barriers so it, you know a lot of the work we do with jigsaw is around directly trying to target that so our youth mental health promotion work we go right we speak to young people we do programs with um, those around them so parents teachers coaches everybody and um, to, to enhance that mental health literacy you know to talk about that idea that this is universal and um, that mental health you know just like we all have dental health we all have mental health really normalizing talking about it um, and and in doing that as well you're, you're minimizing statements so trying to to be as, as accessible I think it's also an onus on all health, you know, health providing organisations um, to really publicly demonstrate this is a place where you will be welcomed and you will be accepted, regardless as to your gender identity or your, your sexual orientation. So, you know, there's really key ways as well we can do that in our, you know, in our social media posts, in the images we have on our website, and um, you know, that there are LGBT flags, and um, you know that the language we use for, for the first time someone picks up the phone and, and talks to one of our service administrators they're asked you know what are your preferred pronouns and what name what's your preferred name that you'd like us to use and, and that is not always the name they give first you know? and so even though the languages how our folks look everything like that and there are other ways i suppose that, that visible, access, yeah. absolutely that visibility and that creating that space where they can be who they are if maybe perhaps outside of a service you know, that, that may be the price. Yeah, that's really Absolutely. interesting. Brendan, thank you so much for your talk earlier. It's like, it was just so exciting. So many different things to, to think about. We'll all be digesting it for days, if not weeks ago. Um, just to delve into something specific that I think was really interesting that you talked about, it, and in particular relating to your uh, research area and focus, that looking at those kind of 16 to 25 year old young bi people. Um, and, and that kind of that they're at higher risk in terms of a lot of these kind of um, you know in terms of, of self injury and, and, you know because perhaps and, and this is I'm just asking you to kind of tell us perhaps but is it because you know they're starting two different identities perhaps and, and perhaps not feeling at home in either and that can be really difficult particularly at a formative age like 16 25 what's driving it what's kind of I'm just curious. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, I guess the very short answer is we're not entirely sure because there's not much research in this area. Um, though, yeah, I guess, so the research I've been involved in has looked at young uh, by people aged 16 to 25 that have self-injury urges or actual behaviour. And we did a, um, I guess, a big survey of about 200 people <coughs> From I think 22 different countries in that took part. We found that self esteem um, was really important, was a really important variable here, as was something called courted belongingness. So it's that idea of feeling disconnected mm -hmm. from community. So those were two things that were really um, important in the kind of self injury picture. I think you're absolutely right. Bi folks have got um, to manage multiple different groups of people. We know from our interviews that we've done with young bi people as well that first of all bi erasure is a huge difficulty, that sense of um, invalidation of their, their sexuality and that idea of this being a phase or even narratives connected to greed or kind of other kind of um, bi pejorative ways of describing this sexual orientation. We also know that biphobia, which kind of bookends I guess bi erasure, is another really important facet that sense of being too gay for the straight world and too straight for the gay world, which is something which I think is probably a narrative or a, is a, a link or, or a mirror, whatever you want to call it, with some gender identity difficulties as well, that sense of maybe trying to pass as a certain gender. And I think certainly what it makes me think about and highlight and what I talk with my trainee psychologist, doing this research is that, I think I touched on it earlier, 
looking at individual groups is so, so important because we know that um, homosexuality erasure or lesbian erasure is not necessarily something that young gay and lesbian people talk about, but it's something that young bi people are really aware of. <coughs> so there's, there's individual facets of their experience as therapists and as youth providers and, and you know, people in, in policy making seats that we need to be aware of. Um, so yeah. And I think particularly, you know, in the LGBTQ plus community, like probably a lot of bio erasure comes from within the community, which can feel incredibly isolating if, if you feel like you're supposed to be within this this grouping and actually people within that group can validate who you are as well, um, which I think is often the case uh, too, if you want to reflect on that. I think that is spot on and I can understand it from a compassionate perspective. So I can understand that when people feel oppressed, people try and exert control. So I know that, well, I, I imagine from some, talking to some people and from lived experience and things like that, I think when people feel a sense of helplessness and lack of control, sometimes oppressing others, whether intentionally or not, is a way to feel validated, but also to feel powerful and in control. So I can understand it, and I talk about this in the book as well, I can understand that sometimes these are behavioral responses some people within the LGBTQ plus communities embody. Mm -hmm. It might also be things like transphobia from kind of cis gay and lesbian people. I can understand that, but what I talk about in the book is that that doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. I can understand where it comes from, but you've still got the responsibility to change that. Yeah. And it's about work. Ourselves and saying, all right, actually, what's coming out of my mouth and what I'm thinking is the words and thoughts of my oppressor. And I'm trying to shift the story a little bit and go, hang on a minute, you're caught up in something here, and let's help you disentangle that. Intersexual liberation again. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, I just want to talk to you perhaps just about schools um, because I know obviously education is the most common area for complaints to your office, um, and I imagine bullying is, is high up there within that category um, of complaint. Um, and building on kind of Brendan's presentation this morning about it being that environmental piece, you know, what are you seeing in terms of what's happening in our schools? And obviously, belong to our doing huge amounts of work through the Stand Up Awareness campaign to try and, uh, and the quality market and everything else, to try and build up schools to be able to create those kind of inclusive communities and safe, safe communities. But what are you seeing in terms of our schools and, and what responsibilities do they have to try and, and safeguard LGBTQ plus young people? Okay, it's be no surprise to say that's complicated. But what yeah. um, we're seeing bullying and education that's the biggest number of complaints for us in the office, and uh, bullying is always one of the top three within that. LGBTQ bullying is a little bit of the work we get, but again, I think we, we don't get to see that. If you think of who we are as an office, we're the last quarter to call. Anyone who's made a complaint to us has to follow me on through complaining to the teacher, to the principal, and the board of management. We don't tend to get that many in regards to this area. But I do think in a, in a broader sense, I think the Department of Education has slowly woken up to the need to be much more open, much more understanding of this broader community of children. I think there's lots of, again, this is our problem in Ireland, it's, it's not the education system. It's the education system we've allowed to grow over the last 110 years. It was decided on by the religious orders and is still the wrong as an independent flight that was around the country, 4,000 independent schools with independent boards of management. So within that, you have fantastic practices. You know, and uh, not to know that. We have some teachers and principals who are just phenomenally positive and encouraging and open to work with children. And then on top of that, you've got a Department of Education, which is probably, I'm not saying speaking of schools, they would set us themselves, the least child centered department in the country, but are changing. Slowly changing. There's a new, new, uh, new movement towards understanding children in a better way, listening to their voice, trying to hear what they can do better. 
So they're moving forward, they started building schools with gender neutral toilets. But they're again they're a conservative organization, so when there is pushback, they often default to the old ways, you know. So we're trying to find some other way to explain this toilet. It's not a gender neutral toilet, it's a, it's a new style of toilet. So those are small things that as Brenda talked about have huge impacts on individuals. You know, they won't be excluded somewhere in Cork. Well, that implication up in Donegal or over Galway or something, so I'm not going to bother designing that. I'm not going to take that design and take a different design. So it's constantly pushing backwards. The really positive things I've seen, again, you and me, we've talked about before. Since I came into office, I've pushed for therapy in schools as a, as a right for children. The fact that we have now, as of the first day this year, academic year, we have children in primary schools having access to therapy. As a pilot, 500 euros is a huge stack, a huge stack. And what's even more encouraging for me is that this was we had to fight tooth and nail to make this happen. Department of Education didn't want to do it. Department of Health didn't want them to do it. We made it happen. And now I have three examples of the Minister for Minister Harris, the Minister for Further Education, has used the example that to promote that mental health, we now have therapy in schools. The head of the HSE, uh, sorry, Chief Operating Officer of the HSE, when he's pushed up the pressure of the bad cancer, he said, well, look, there's 500 euros we use in primary schools to help in mental health education, even though they try to block it. So they now recognize that going upstream involves in the Department of Education. And I'd always push that that 5 million should be matched with the same amount of money that the Department of Health. And hopefully we will move in that direction. Now, how does that help this group of children? It helps by when you're 8, 9, 10 years of age. You, won't, you may not know what the issue is, but you've got somebody to talk to. If you've got somebody to talk to, then by the time you're 12, you will feel more comfortable talking to somebody. And it starts to change the culture. It's the same with the parents, it's the same with the teachers. And it also relieves the teachers of the pressure of having to be a psychologist or a therapist or a good adult in that sphere where they may not be well, well attuned to. So for me, we are started thin edge of a very important wedge in that regard. And my hope, my expectation is that that pattern will grow. Maybe five years from now, we'll have every school covered with it, and then we'll move into primary, post primary. But I think we will also see, the most important part is that we will also start to see both departments working together. Because if you have a therapist in school who needs to refer to a CAMS or to a primary care, the best way to do that is to already have a primary care connection or a CAMS connection to that school. So I think we start to see what it should be again. We're taking from every other country in Europe to do with this. We're not we're not really pioneers here, we're, we're at the back end of the trade getting this happen. But for me that's encouraging and um, I hope it will benefit a lot of the newer generation of young people who have to go through these queries about themselves and allow them the space to expand on that in a safe space. Yeah, so I think it's really important like, that we understand that mental health isn't the domain of just the Department of Health or the HEC, that actually it's everybody's role and responsibility to create that normalized culture of talking about how you're feeling, which ultimately kind of creates that that uh, destigmatization of, of mental health issues generally, so that if you are struggling as an LGBTQ plus young person, a queer young person, then ultimately actually because in primary school you've got experience of talking about how you're feeling, it's, it's not as difficult to labor much, which is really important. Um, I might go back to you in a moment, just about those young people, like often we see young queer people who've had those difficulties in school, who've had those difficulties in mental health, coming to, to youth reach and kind of falling out of education uh, as well, so I might just come back to you on that. But Natalie, I just want to explore a little bit around, so I think anybody in the room who's kind of providing services to LGBTQ plus young people will understand that getting them in the door in the first place obviously is a struggle, you know, in terms of getting them to, to recognize that they need help or that you know it is a safe space to come and get support. What kind of techniques do you use to keep young people engaged? Because I think you know we run a 24-7 texting service in Spot Age and we have it's about it's around 35% of our texters are queer and they will talk to us about you know not being deserving of help, you know, I'm taking up the space for somebody who needs it more than I do. You know, what, what can we do to make that help seeking journey kind of, 
you know, as, as validating as possible so that they stay engaged with it. I think talking, um, I think what is important is to focus on families, to focus on the adults as much as we want to pay attention to the young people, but they learn from us. Like I think about what um, Brendan was saying earlier on about you can't separate, we are a community. So as a community, how can a child learn how to talk when the parents are not talking? So we have to educate the parents, we have to educate the adults in the child's life to talk about emotions, to normalize what is normal identities, different identities, sexual identities, gender identities. We have to educate. I think that is what is important. And then hopefully that will help young people to be able to open up and to talk about whatever that is going on without feeling any shame or without feeling any guilt. Do you find young people disengaging um, from support because, you know, for whatever reason they don't feel like actually for them it's, it's, it's not something that, uh, that they feel is, is validating or do you feel like that they're kind of guilty because they're taking up you know, what they perceive to be spaces for, for other people who are, who are worse. Like one of the things from belong to research that's always struck me is that queer young people have to be at such a higher level of distress before they reach out for support. Is that something that's kind of coming up in, in terms of when people first present to you? Yes, it does, but it's more complex than that, we think, because what tends to happen is you're talking you're looking at a technical group. The way we is the parents have to be. So if we have a, during the therapy session or the other risk design, you have to inform them in case of emergency, which is, which is the legal guardian. So some of the things that tends to happen is um, most of the LGBT young people, they are very sensitive, they are very, very extremely caring people. So you find that they worry about their parents having to um, take time off work, or also if they have other kids in the family and other things that are happening in the family. So they are quite sensitive to that. And those are the things that sometimes are various when it comes to them asking for help, because to them they are just thinking, oh well, it's just my sexuality, or well, it's just my gender, I will be okay, you know, things like that. So that is the initial, um, I suppose, the barriers. In staying in therapy, sometimes we find that, again, the reason why I'm saying it's complex, because sometimes parents um, or adults, we are not very sensitive when it comes to expressing our frustrations. So it could be kind of like very small little things of saying, you know, like I'm so busy, or I have to do this, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And the young person is they're hearing that and they're soaking it all up. So then what they are going to do is they're going to pretend that they are fine so that they stop going to therapy because they don't want to see mom stress, they don't want to see dad stress. And then the other things is the other thing as well that tends to come up a lot is um, going for therapy during um, I suppose school. Uh, Sometimes some teachers we find that they tend to make comments or they are not sensitive in uh, letting the, the, the child leave class to go for therapy and then come back and then when they come back, I don't know, they are kind of ashamed or it's mentioned as they walk into the class because they just want to be invisible, they just want to come in and go without anybody noticing what is going on, where they are going because that's when the questions start. Where are you going every Tuesday at 10? Where are you going every Wednesday at 10? And they don't want to tell other people. They may be not ready to tell other people where they're going to. So all of those they kind of like things that we tend to notice. And most young people, they tend to talk about those things in, in therapy. That's really interesting. And it's kind of, you know, it's related to the reform of mental health act. So because it's, it's kind of that piece around 16, 17 year olds being able to consent to their own mental health care and actually removing that barrier in terms of having to have that um, parental involvement, although if where possible, obviously it's really helpful for that to be the case. But in, in terms of that piece where where you're, you know you feel like you're a burden for accessing something that you fully and totally deserve, and that piece around you know um, that, that that piece around capacity as well, in terms of 
and feeling like actually I'm fine, it's, it, it, it's, it's okay. Tara, uh, Jigsaw have established the, the really well-known concept of that one good out. I'm sure there's lots of one good out in the room for lots of, of young people. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about what that concept means and is and how can, how can services, you know, who may not be in a caregiver role formally, how can we kind of, you know, gender that in our services to, to, for, for queer young people in particular? And so the one good adult concept came from uh, a couple of pieces of research, uh, the Myro Surveys and the Myro Survey 2, which was a collaboration between Jigsaw and UCD School of Psychology. Um, and that the second one, Myro Survey 2, was released in 2019. And we surveyed over 19,000 young people all over Ireland. And it was the largest scale piece of research on, on mental health. Plus, um, we're very highly represented in that. So, our adolescent sample that the school goers was by 12%, but our young adults, the 18 to 25, um, it was 24% of respondents um, identified. So, so that's a, just a, a helpful thing to note. Um, and really, I suppose one of the key findings from those surveys, all about you know, how are you feeling, what's going on in your life, what's going well, what's not going so well. One of the key findings, and, and really significant findings, was the importance of the presence of the supportive adults in the life of the young person. And we asked people in that survey as well who that was, and, and the, the number one response was a parent, but there were a huge range of other responses there, so other family members, teachers, youth workers, coaches came up quite a lot. And so that idea that it's someone that young person can turn to when they need to, to talk things through. Um, and the research that came out of that survey was really overwhelming. It's, it's such a protective factor for the mental health of, of young people. And um, so it literally you know, reduces uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression and, and suicidality. It, it promotes um, resilience and self-confidence. And you know, those young people that have one good adults, they're literally more optimistic about the future. Um, so it's, it's a really, really powerful concept. Um, a lot of the youth mental health promotion work we do is, is based on that, and um, so we have one good adult programs, and, and we also tailor that specifically for um, different cohorts within that. So, and um, one good coaches, for example, one good managers, and um, all of these, everything is one good something in, in Jigsaw. And yeah. um, so we do work really closely with those people, and and often it is saying actually by the very fact you've come to this training, you probably are already one good adult. You know, it's not. A mystery. We're not expecting good adult, adults to be therapists or to you know to be counsellors. And um, really, it's it's just you know someone that is approachable, someone that will listen to the young person, that will be non-judgmental, but just be compassionate, just kind to the young person, you know, and yeah. um, and really open. So it's also kind of about demystifying that. And um, and then you know there are skills around it. So you know it's kind of active listening skills and also things like signposting skills. I think are really important to share and there are a lot of mental health resources and supports out there and it's about just helping people to navigate well what are you know where where should I go for, for this particular reason or where should I sign post this young person and um, what's the most appropriate support that which could be really difficult for lots of us even working within the, the system and we need to get better as a system for making that simpler for young people to navigate as well 100 percent Brendan as a as a clinician um, as a clinical psychologist in terms of there's lots of people in the room who are who are working to support queer young people, what are kind of some of the techniques that, that you found are really important for actually supporting queer young people to talk about their mental health? That's a really, really good question. Uh, so I think people that are probably not in the clinical psychology or therapy world would probably be a little bit shocked at the amount of time I spent talking to people about shoes where they go on holiday, um, you know, what their favorite superhero is, because I think relationships and trust, that one good adult type idea, which I guess is essentially attachment based, is so important. So I think a, a, a pivotal therapy technique for me is spending a lot of time to build a relationship, because someone is not, if someone's gone through repeated experiences of, um, feeling unsafe with others, of course they're going to be guarded. That makes sense. 
So actually spending some time to go, do you know what? I don't know everything. I'm maybe not going to get everything right. I might even get some of our discussions about your identity a bit wrong. But if I do, can you correct me? Because I want, I want to try and get it right. You know? So just spending some time talking with people, building that relationship is so important. I actually also think something that, uh, it's not even a technique, I think it's something which we can, can all do if we feel comfortable doing this, is I think visibility is a really powerful, well, it's a very, we know it's a powerful suicide prevention strategy, but it's, a, it's an empowering strategy as well. So actually um, having uh, physical signs or, or physical signifiers in your office or organization that you're a safe place that's really important because people will clock it, um, and they'll, they'll, you know, even uh, kind of certain flags which other people might not necessarily recognise. The person that needs and wants to recognise it will recognise it. Um, so yeah, I guess um, relationship building, visibility. I guess also meeting people where they're at is probably an important skill and technique. I think it was mentioned earlier about. Um, what we're talking about specifically, but about how to kind of get people or keep people engaged or something like that. And I think understanding someone's position in the world and with, with their mental health journey is so important because again, if we're going in there with the wrong, um, the wrong agenda, so to speak, we're thinking, right, this is what needs to be solved and fixed, mm -hmm. and it's not tallying up with what they think they need to solve or fix. That's a perfect way to rupture <laughs> your relationship. So I think just kind of really, I, I guess I try and use a lot of open-ended questions like, um, what, what do you think this is about? Mm -hmm. And we'll see each other. What, what do you think um, we're, we're going to talk about? Or what, what do you want to talk about here? And just trying to keep it really um, young person oriented as well. Because I know that if they start talking about something like superheroes or Lego or whatever it is, I can then try and bring that around to mental health and I say, oh, you know, yeah, that particular superhero sometimes feels a bit sad and angry, don't they? And I'm just wondering, like, do you ever feel sad and angry a bit like Thor or whatever? And just, you know, try and create that shared language. And that, I think, can be, for younger people, yeah. and maybe, you know, even, you know, the, the really younger people, that can be a perfect way rather than all this kind of CBT techniques and stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's the basics, it's the feeling heard, it's the building that rapport so that there's trust, building, you know, kind of that relationship so that they feel, even if, you know, it's, it's you're not, you can try to relate to somebody even though they're, 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 your experiences are different, just that there's an interest there that you're demonstrating you want to know more and so that you can kind of create that sort of space for, for a young person to open up. I think that's really, really important. Um, no, just coming to services, so we talked a lot about seeking and people reaching out for support. Uh, often that's that's easier said than done, particularly in Ireland and also particularly in terms of trans healthcare, if you're talking about healthcare more broadly, but um, maybe speaking about mental health care first and then and maybe you might touch on the trans healthcare piece separately, you know, the system is really, really broken at the moment. Um, there's lots of services uh, providing services to to young know, queer people. How do, you, how do they navigate it? What needs to change and how can, can we parents in particular caregivers and young people themselves get access to the support they need when they need it? Okay. Um, <laughs> that would be a question. Yeah, well, I suppose what comes to mind is that in order for a system to be broken, there has to be a system there to start with. Mm. I'm not sure we've got a system there to start, to start with. I think we have, we have built up a huge, you can see here, a huge network of NGOs and health-related services that have really stepped up to the mark and done a huge amount of work. And again, I think we're, we're more and more open as a nation to the to the wider queer agenda and health agenda. So I think there's a lot more work done in nurses, doctors, teachers. The health system are much more open to all of these what you call oppressive issues before we're trying to fix them. I think that's clear. There's a huge step that's particularly in the physical health sphere. Mental health sphere is even further ahead there. So I think that's right. But I think in the trials, there just isn't a system. You know, I think 
there is nothing to navigate. Um, and I think for me, it's one of the, uh, that abdication responsibility in that regard by sending it abroad. And I don't mind sending things abroad while you're planning to upskill yourselves and bring it back again. But we did that, and we've now let them down again because that, that has failed. So I think for us, the, the promise that we're going to the, the, the government's uh, proposal for government program needs to be fulfilled. That's one thing that I think is really trailing behind that fact that we haven't invested in proper, um, rounded healthcare for all of our children. And from that point of view, I've met so many young people in all the different scenarios that there can be for young people, some of move forward in the transition, some who stalled in the transition, some who thought about it, didn't do it, all sorts of areas. But all they keep telling me is that it's luck if you happen to find that one good adult, that one good therapist, that one good psychologist, that one good medical person that can help you. And we need to step up and make that happen. And I think what's happened is we've, I think, again, when I talk about the Department of Education, we've been served, but I think that last step of changing the mindset around this issue has to happen now so that we can provide whatever is needed for the children. Each child has the individual right to the best possible health care. And for me, that's what I'm pushing forward is to try to make sure something is starting to happen. So that we can't keep this one. We need to set it up now that we started today. It will take a number of years, which means children are suffering in that meantime. But to not do anything or to, to be hanging over what it's called, you know, these things need to be sorted out on behalf of the children as quickly as possible. For me, unfortunately, that's the real black mark in this area, and it's something I can't give optimism on, yeah. unfortunately. Yes. But, you know, we can understand then why trans young people, if, if they're not getting the support and the care that they need, why ultimately they're at higher risk for so many different issues with their mental health because their, their identities aren't being validated. They're not able to get to that place where they need to in order to, to fully be who they want to be. Absolutely. Even just even just that conversation, that exploration, can be so heated. You know, you may not get full answers, you may not be able to do something easily, but you've got a space, you've got somewhere, you've got options. You can say, oh, there's an option, I'm going to wait a year, whatever it might be. But it's that openness and acceptance that needs to be there. And it needs to be known around the company that here's the three places you have to go to, and we have professionals who will treat you with respect and give you all the opportunities and the options. It shouldn't be all that of capability at this point in time in the nation of this magnitude and this quality of funding and finance. And, you know, it's about taking the step. Yeah. You know, so I can really, from my point of view, the government have let so many children down. Yeah. 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 All of the work that you did was really important for youth advocates, volunteers we have, which like you're talking about, that belong to, and they inform us, inform everything we do. Um, but a lot of our clinicians have kind of identified that within this umbrella of LGBT, you know, they're released, I suppose, obey with issues of the trans young people. And again, our youth advocates, and we did, you know, we had lots of youth advocates identifying as, as gay or, or lesbian, but we didn't have many as trans. So um, a number of the clinicians started up a group. And the Elevating Trans Voices group within Jigsaw. And, and that's made up of some staff from Jigsaw and also a lot of young people, some of whom were involved in Jigsaw, some who yeah. weren't, and who identify as trans, and really look at how to elevate that, that voice. There's no time to reference the group, it's very much for the group to decide where they need to go. And so one of their first things they produced, um, it's, it's on the Jigsaw uh, YouTube channel, but it's a video um, on understanding what it means to be a trans young person in Ireland. Um, but just say that's been an incredibly helpful group, and I think it, it goes back to what you said, Brendan, about you know, being open and saying we're not going to get everything right. You know, yeah. we, have, we all have space to learn, and you know, please correct me if I, if I get something wrong, or you know, that openness to learn. I think it's so important to learn from the young people, but I think also that creates that social safety as well, doesn't it? To say we're, we're trying our best, and, but we're not perfect. And, yeah. yeah. It's so important for us to, like, it, it could apply to any group of young people, any kind of identity across the intersectionality of identities. How can we make our service more accessible, friendly, safe for you to engage with it? And 
that's, that's a really important message. Um, we're just at the end, we're wrapping up. Um, I was hoping that maybe each of the panelists might just share with the, the group kind of one message to take home, you know, in terms of providing mental health supports or spaces for your young people, you know, what should we be thinking about? And maybe we'll start with you, Brendan. So on the following the intersectionality thread, so I think you have on there. I guess my one um, line would probably be young LGBTQ plus people are also young people. So all those difficulties and experiences and situations that come with being a young person are also there. <laughs> and they've also got the LGBTQ plus stuff on top of that. But sometimes I think when we think, when we put those two words together, young LGBTQ plus people, we kind of think of them as just this one thing. But they're also young people that have got all those challenges to grow up, you know, you know that person's schools and like, they might not be my friend, you know, also arguments with mum and dad or caregivers, that's all going on. Maybe independent or connected to the LGBTQ plus stuff, but that's also important for us to hold in mind. Yeah, it's layers upon layers. It's that podium piece. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Tara? Thank you. Um, I think that idea of the context, every young person comes to us uh, as you know, a part of the community, a part of the context. And it, it's switching that lens of, you know, maybe traditionally in, in, in therapy, you know, what, what we may not have said, and, you know, the approach is all about what's wrong with you, you know, what, why you become, what's wrong with you. And that idea that, you know, it's not what's wrong, there's nothing wrong with the person, it's what's happened to you, you know, it's it's what's happening within that context and, and, and zooming out and, and seeing, and, and often, like you, you talked about earlier, you know, even if young people are, have behaviours that are not helpful for themselves, they're very understandable reactions to the situation they find themselves in and the context. Um, and we really need to, you know, to help LGBT young people to feel that sense of belonging, you know, and that, that yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with them, and yeah. um, there's a lot in the context. I, I agree with what you said earlier, that's incredibly powerful, and um, because sometimes that's the first time they've heard that. Yeah. Know, it might seem obvious to us, but and totally. um, just hearing that can be really uh, eye opening. Absolutely. Nash? Language. I love language. Be sensitive to the things that you say, how you say them, to young people, to yourselves. Um, also check your privileges. Um, I suppose I'm talking from the place of a person with, with you know a few minorities, and this is my experience as an adult. So I can only imagine what it is like to be a young person who's not being seen. So I would say language and also checking your privileges. That's great, and, and with language as well, not being afraid to make mistakes. You know, kind of to what Brendan was saying, like. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know that being open so that you know you're, you're creating that opportunity for learning as well. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things that Brendan did this morning. Was he, he reunited my clinical juices. <laughs> it's like a, I really miss being a clinician, uh, the therapist, and being in the room and creating that relationship. But I think the other piece that, he, that stuck for me was his very strong and stark reminder that we're not all uh, everything's bloody. You know, we have a voice in, in other areas as well. Um, and again, I, I'm constantly, at my age, I'll say I'm over 40. Maybe I'll leave it at that. I've been around a while. I'm, I've been, a, I've been a, a staunch GA man all my life, and I still, at my age, have not met too many gay, gay folklers, quarters, you know, and then, you know, but I've met 20 in a panel of 40 ladies folklers. So I think we still need to help and support, and I think those visibility things are the things that we need to start thinking about within our GA club, rugby club, gymnastic club, whatever it might be. That's the political small actions in your local area that can make a difference as well. Like you might never even know it's made a difference, yeah. but we made that step within. And again, using my own personal experience within the GA, we made that step around mental health being much more talked about and available and there's signs that say this is the same goes to in every dressing room. So I think politically we can make steps in other areas as well. Yeah. Whether you're in a drama club, whatever it might be, that's the thing I think us 
normal on the ground people can make a difference with. Yeah, absolutely. That visibility, like you might, you might think of, you know, it's just a the ratio of life, but actually, to a young person that's showing up for their first game or first training session, that's actually incredibly important for them to see, so that they feel safe and that they have a, a place there. Um, yeah, and just just for me, I mean, I think this morning has been. Um, an opportunity to, to do that Zoom lounge piece again. I think we're always kind of thinking about how can we get young, young queer people to open up? How can we get them to get support and, and come to us for help? And actually, the first thing we need to do is tell them that actually you are not the, the problem. You know, the environment is, <laughs> and your context in society is the thing that, that's making you feel how you feel, you know, at the, at the beginning. Um, and kind of create that safe space then for them to come in and to talk to us about that and help them to unpack it. Um, thank you so much to our panel. Please give them a round of applause. moderating that really interesting uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, I learned so much and uh, as Niall Niall said, we, all of us in here who care so much about mental health uh, and well-being of LGBTQ plus young people, uh, we, we can't be, we can't care that much, as much as we do, without becoming advocates and activists and back to the t-shirts I think intersectional liberation activists, we'll all get those t-shirts uh, uh, printed up after this. Um, okay, so for our final offering today, I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Brendan Dunlap back, we're really putting him to work today.